I can go to a bank and I can put 20% down on the property and not have PMI and not have any of that stuff. And so I'm putting down $20,000 and I'm getting a hundred thousand dollar value and I'm paying back the mortgage monthly, you know, but it's over the course of 30 years, right? I cannot take out an $80,000 loan and end up with a hundred thousand dollars worth of stocks. And so that's the reason why real estate is so much faster. Yeah. What's up everybody? Your life alchemist, your dragon. Welcome to Alchemized Life. I'm your host, Justin David Carl. This is a show where I seek out and share expertise, wisdom, and thought leadership in all domains with the mission of empowering and inspiring you to proactively design and truly live a life worth living. We're all in this together. And when we do the work together, we go so much farther, so much faster, and have so much more fun. Without further ado, let's dig into this episode and alchemize life. James, Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show. Super excited to reconnect with you. It's been uh, probably a year and a half, maybe even two years since we last connected You both came and actually gave a guest speaker uh, panel at one of my like money mastermind meetups shortly into the age of uh, COVID where everything went virtual, including our mastermind meetup that used to be in person. So I'm really excited to catch up. I know you have a lot of new stuff that you've done in the last like couple of years or so, but uh, first and foremost, deep thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Yeah. thank you. So to set the scene for the audience, James and Emily Lowry are um, the two brilliant individuals behind Rethink the Rat Race. They are real estate investors. I would call them serial entrepreneurs at this point, digital course creators, and, you know, financially independent, savvy, money people. And uh, we're going to talk to them about their financial journey. So to kind of kick things off, how did you become financially independent? And before we even go there, I'm actually curious how the two of you define financial independence. Um, I don't know how Emily defines it. How I define it is to be able to do what you want without the worry of money. Now, if what you want to do happens to make money, then great. I'm not the financial independence police. I'm not telling people that they're not retired or they are retired. If you don't have to worry about what you're doing and all your living expenses are covered by passive means um, or mostly passive means, then to me, you're financially independent. I do what like about? that. The not have to worry about what you're doing, like, you know, what, what you want to do without worrying about money. Yeah. Yeah, I like to stay away personally from FIRE, F-I-R-E, because, like, all the five people that I know, like, they're all up doing cool shit that requires work, but it's, like, work they're super passionate about. And I like to think that, like, if you're doing work that, like, makes you come alive, like, that's what work really should be. And humans are, like, the one thing that makes us happy is progress. Right. And so as long as you're working on something that like is creating progress for you and, you know, other people and you're passionate about it, like, like, why not work? Like who, who wants to sit around like 24 seven for the rest of their life? Yeah, exactly. And it's like the type of people that reach financial independence are obviously self-motivated and they're financially savvy and all these things. And then I guess the internet just expects you to cut it off the day that you say that you're fine, you know, to be retired. Yeah. Right. You, you're no longer allowed to make a dollar. You're no longer allowed to be motivated uh, to do anything that may or may not be productive. Yeah. Awesome. Well, take us back. I know you guys weren't always financially independent. And I know, you know, doing my research, James, like similar to me, like money was not easy growing up for you and your family. So so let's take it back and kind of pave the way forward to where you are now. Yeah, so uh, let's see. My my lowest point, I'll just go ahead and start there. Just get that out in the open. Uh, I was actually on a date with Emily, and my card got declined at a red box. 
and <laughs> I was probably like 19, 20 years old, and I didn't have a dollar seven to my name. And so I lied and said that my card was messed up and it wasn't working. So she ended up buying our Redbox movie that night. Because I, I mean, the shame of trying to tell someone that you're <laughs> dating, like, hey, I don't have a dollar. And so <laughs> that was the lowest point of my life, uh, personally, like that I had complete control over. Like growing up, you know, we had our utilities cut off multiple times. We had cars repossessed. Uh, my mom still struggles with money and, you know, her phone was cut off like a week ago. And so, uh, so I, I wish I could say that like looking at us, you know, people have changed their ways, but that's not necessarily true. Yeah. What date was that? Like how many dates were you in before that happened? Oh, date. That was pretty early on. Yeah. Like, I mean, we had dated, like, I guess we had gone a few dates. It was to the point where we weren't having to go out to the movies anymore. Cause that was initially like our MO was like, we would go out and get dinner and go to a movie. And so at this point we were doing like nights in watching, you know, red box, uh, movies and like doing a take and bake pizza or something. So it had to have been maybe a month or two into our dating. You think I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At least. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say that I had no idea of his financial situation until I guess after we got married and we started on, you know, the whole like saving money and all that kind of stuff. I had no idea. I hit it well, I guess. I, yeah. But some people would call that financial infidelity, right? And so it wasn't mm. like I was trying to purposely hide it from her. We just didn't talk about money. Like it was never a topic. Yeah. I wouldn't have lied and said that I was doing well. But I w it, as soon as it came in, I was living hand to mouth. But it was with like nice things. I wanted to show off that I had a nice car. I had the newest phone. But really, I was yeah. broke. So And you were selfless yeah. too. You know, use all the money to go like for gas just to come see me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and go I was very generous stuff. with money yeah. despite the fact that I didn't yeah. have any. <laughs> Yeah, I so feel you, James. I was the same way. Like, you know, I had to look rich because growing up, you know, I we were broke. Like, and I just wanted to like people to think I was rich because I wanted to be rich so bad. So I, I have a lot of compassion for you, brother. How about you, Emily? How did it, uh, how did, you know, things start with you? Like, where were you financially with your, your family? So I grew up in a single income household and my parents were, you know, about the Dave Ramsey and all about budgeting and, you know, being, I guess, smart with your money. And they did try to, you know, teach me, I guess, the basics. And I remember, I guess, whenever I lived on my own, I just remember at a certain point I was doing you know too much like online ordering and you know purchasing like frivolous things and that I just kept you know going slightly lower than that lower than that until you know kind of like got to empty but it wasn't <laughs> like I went into you know like it wasn't like I got into debt that I couldn't get out of or anything like that and I was I don't know I guess I try to be smart about it but it's not like I I guess I was always thinking that once I got this job then I could you know go and get these things or you know, that kind of thing. So I had that, I guess, in the back of my mind that I needed to make the money to be able to get, you know, X, Y, Z. But mm -hmm. as much as they tried to teach me about, you know, money and, you know, the general, I don't know, just everything about money, I guess I didn't really, you know, uh, implement those things into my life and everything until <laughs> we started into like our you know journey. So you were the typical American. Yeah. yeah, we were typical Americans. <laughs> typical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As was I. All right. So, how long did you guys date until you got married? So it was about four years. Yeah, yeah, four years mm -hmm. of okay. dating. Of dating. Yeah. yeah. And then, when did you finally? Did you talk about money before you get married? We really did it. Like, it's amazing how yeah. little we talk about money. Like, uh, I mean, Emily, like. She she went to school to be an engineer, mm -hmm. and so we knew that she was going to be making more money than I was because I had gone to community college and at the time didn't even have a degree. Um, now, it turns out that I had taken enough classes at the community college to get my associate's degree, but we didn't find that out until we had already been married for almost two years. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have a degree uh, for, you know, the first two years of our marriage or, you know, at that point, I guess I was somewhere around 27, 28 years old, I realized that I had enough credits to even have an associate's degree. Uh, so we always knew that Emily was going to be out earning me. 
but we just never really talked about how much that meant, like how much money it was, like all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when we got our job offers as like married people, we talked about, you know, like what we were making and stuff like that. But it wasn't necessarily in a like, how can we save the money type thing? Yeah. But mm. whenever, so my, my parents did help me out with community college. And then with the understanding that I would pay for my last two years or however long it went, it took me to finish my degree. And so I was responsible for paying for university. And I think, I don't know if it was, so I, I went for a total of five years, but I don't know if it was in the last year or the, like the, the second to last year, I had to borrow money from James. So I didn't have to take out a loan. So he actually helped me, you know, pay for the last, like for a portion of my schooling. So I, you know, and again, I had no idea that, you know, he was broke. Right. <laughs> That's crazy. So, so I mean, you, I guess we, you didn't have any money, but you lent her money. Yeah, yeah. I guess I had enough at that time. Like I was, I was hood rich. Like honestly, <laughs> like the money came in and it was gone within a few days. <laughs> like I got paychecks, you know, from working, and I just blew it as soon as it came in. It was wild. It's crazy. All right. So when did you first? discover financial independence and like walk us through kind of like that awakening so uh we found out about financial independence i was actually at work and i worked at a physical therapy clinic and there was a patient who what were you gonna say i was gonna say it was about a year after we got married oh yeah okay so it was about a year after we got oh. married and uh, i'm at work and there was a patient there and I'm, you know, just sitting at the front, I'm working, uh, admin, like I'm essentially the office manager of this uh, clinic and I'm sitting at the front and I can just hear, you know, the conversations that are going on. And there was, uh, a patient there who was talking to her therapist about a blog and she said, you know, I wish I had found out about this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, if I had my husband and I would be retired right now. And I'd always been interested in like retirement and you know financial stuff because i felt like so my parents are deaf right and so they didn't they didn't have the access i think to that information about like i in my mind you know like i would hear about like a 401k or something like someone some adult talking about a conversation and in my mind people are having these conversations around the dinner table right but my parents mm -hmm. aren't because they're deaf and they don't have access to that information and so i felt like i was like just trying to play catch up, uh, hearing about stuff like that, like IRAs and 401ks and, you know, how to contribute and matches and all this kind of stuff. I had no clue about any of it. And so I felt like I was playing catch up. And when I heard this person say, you know, and she's, you know, in middle age, she's not at retirement age. And she says, you know, if my husband and I had found out about this, we would have been retired, you know, now. And we would have found out about 10 years ago. That really piqued my interest. And so uh, I asked, I didn't ask her, I asked her therapist, uh, my coworker, what that website was that she had said. And the therapist said, I'll look into it and I'll let you know if it's worth like reading into or not. And I was like, what the hell? Like this person is trying to gatekeep this information from me. This is absolute bullshit. So she put the sticky note on her desk and went and like started helping another patient. I might have gone to lunch or something. So I went to her desk and picked up the sticky note and looked at it. And it said MrMoneyMustache.com. Right. And so I, I found out about that and I was hooked because it also felt like information that I wasn't supposed to have yet. You know, like mm. this person tried to gatekeep the information from me. And so I wasn't supposed to know what it even was. And again, I didn't know anything about 401ks. I didn't know anything about IRAs, like, but I was interested in it because I felt like it was something that everyone else knew about, but I didn't. And I didn't know that no one actually knows about it. Like the average person, like, knows nothing about their 401k and so uh that's how we found out about financial independence and i dove headfirst into it i was obsessed yeah you and i are very similar james uh i'm curious was there a particular article or articles that kind of where you're like oh my god like you know that really made <laughs> you be like this is it this is what i've been looking for i'm just curious well, the shockingly simple math behind early retirement is probably his most popular article. And like, it just breaks down the math of it so simply. But honestly, it was probably one of the articles where he was just bitching about people riding in their cars. And he's like, you're weak for riding in an SUV, like all this kind of stuff. Like, I loved it. I was like, man, I need that like brash mentality. Like, tell me that I'm being a little bitch about doing something. 
and then I'll change my ways. Like that's all you have to do. Like it's tell me that yeah. I sh- like that I'm weak for doing something, and like, that's all you had to do. Like I was hooked. <laughs> yeah, I experienced a very similar thing. It was like I I needed somebody with his like coaching attitude at that time in my life because I you know I had made tons of money and just like you know I drove the Range Rover and I I ate out every single meal and I lived in a super fancy condo that I didn't own and I just like pissed down you know the the uh, the rent and I needed somebody <laughs> to just be like you're a fucking idiot like you could be retired by now. Like you could be like a millionaire by now if you hadn't been such an idiot. And that was exactly what I need. And and for me, it was the shockingly simple math because which we'll put a, a link in the show notes. Because then I looked at the math and I was like, oh my fucking god! Similar to that, like uh, that patient who said, like if I had known this, you know, ten years ago, I would already be, you know, financially independent or rich or wealthy or a millionaire. And that was like for me, because I was making like 150 to almost 300 grand a year, but I was saving nothing. So, okay, you, you discover Mr. Money Mustache, and then how do you bring that to Emily? How does that go? The worst way possible. So I beat her home that day. <laughs> Absolute worst way possible. I beat her home that day. And what do I do? I've, I've read a bunch of the articles already. I'm on the forums. I'm scrolling through. I'm finding out like all of the little tidbits on how to save money and how to be the cheapest motherfucker in the world and (laughs) so she comes home and i've already like it's like 75 degrees out and i've already cut the air conditioner off like i'm like we're (laughs) not using the air conditioner like i went up it's humid too right heater yeah yeah it's humid we're in alabama (laughs) and so it's like you're walking into a wall of like moisture and uh, i went upstairs to our hot water heater and i changed the temperature on that because i was like you know, this is going to save me pennies a month. Like, I better do this. <laughs> and so it was stuff like that. Like, it was terrible. And so she can tell you what happened when she came home. Well, it was just, it was one of those where it's like, okay, like, you know, it, we hadn't, I guess, you know, we'd been together for, married for a year. So we hadn't, I guess, gotten into uh, a lifestyle, a certain lifestyle. You know, we were still learning how to live together, you know, be married, all that kind of stuff. And so... I guess at that point, it was like, okay, we can no longer go out to eat. We can no longer go shopping. We can no longer do this, that, and the other. And it was just, I don't know, just shocking, like, to, like, be, come home and be like, you can't do this anymore. You can't do this anymore. And so it was, it was. It sounds very controlling, but that's not the way it was. Right. No, like, I, no I'm just trying to get, like. This, yeah, no, like, I get it. I get it. I'm just saying, like, when we like, tell the story, it sounds like I'm an asshole. I'm yeah. like, you are not doing this anymore. And that's not the way it was. Yeah. We had a lifestyle. And then I said, okay, everything about that lifestyle was wrong and we need to change it immediately. And there's no, (laughs) like, there's no in between, like, let's just jump entirely into an entirely different, like, lifestyle. And so it was one of the, like, I kind of reined them back and then it was. And I just slowly whittled her down. You know, that's what happened, right? (laughs) Uh, I started living by example instead of just saying, like, we should do this, we should do this. I bought a bike and started biking to work. And at the time we had three cars. And so I started doing like stuff like that. Like I started packing my lunch. I used to, when I worked uh, and drove to work, I mean, I, I did work, uh, but when I, <laughs> when I would go to lunch, I would drive to work and I would come home for lunch and then drive back to work. Uh, so I wasn't spending money out on food. I was at least coming home, but I realized like that's such a waste of time and gas. And so I started biking to work and bringing my lunch with me. Or I would bring like, I would drive one day a week and bring clothes and all my lunches. And so I would have Mm. food at work ready for me to make and have like, it it was like food prepping or I would buy like a loaf of bread and some sandwich meat. And I would just like (laughs) make like the saddest sandwiches you've ever seen for lunch. And, uh, and so I started living by example and we would go on daily walks because we had a dog. Mm -hmm. And as we're going on our walks and I'm just like slowly whittling her down, I'm sending her articles and in her defense, Mr. Money Mustache does not speak to everybody, right? And that's not that's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to find the people like you and me, Justin, that need that type of mentality. And he's not trying to speak to, you know, everybody. Like, I, I need a chip on my shoulder. She doesn't have that, right? And, yeah. like, that's great. You had a very great, like, life growing up. Uh, <laughs> some people don't have that. 
And so I needed that like brash mentality and that didn't speak to her. She found someone that does speak to her uh, or didn't, you know, it's just different things. So me sending her those articles didn't necessarily help, but the daily walks and us talking and, you know, she wasn't enjoying her job. And so when I say, you know, like you don't have to work anymore, then all of a sudden that becomes like a lot more intriguing. Well, and it's also, it was, it's one thing to read the articles, but it's another thing to like, I don't know, have it simplified down and like getting told about, I mean, like a summary of the articles, but also like about, you know, the 4% rule or, you know, saving for retirement, all that kind of stuff. And like saying it in a way that's easy to understand. And, but also like talking about it in, you know, an example of like your life, you know, and saying, you know, how it could be or, you know, like how we would implement it kind of thing. And so I think that hearing it from, that aspect really sold me. Two questions for you, Emily. One, did he take away the going out to movies is the first question. Okay. Yes. But I think that we had already. I didn't take it away. I, mean, I think that we had already kind of stopped. It was just yeah. one of those where, I don't know, like, I don't enjoy, most of the time I don't enjoy going to the movies because one, mm. you can't like pause it, go to the bathroom. Um but two, like, because, you know, his mom is, or his parents are deaf, like, I have gotten used to watching movies and TV shows with subtitles. And so, like, mm. it, that's kind of hard to, to, not, to watch movies without subtitles anymore. But also, you can't have conversations. Mm -hmm. And mm. it's, you know, completely dark for, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. And so, like, mm. I don't know, I guess, like, the attention span and, you know, the, um, just everything is kind of hard to, to stay silent or you know sit through a movie for that long so i think at that point we had already kind of cut out the movies yeah um, the reason i asked that is because that's what i did in my marriage or we, <laughs> we we weren't even married at the time but we had been dating for and, and we're living together and i was like we're not going to the movies anymore and my, <laughs> <laughs> my partner was like she looked at me like i just like killed a kitten <laughs> like it was like what yeah. like what, what kind of life are you creating for us and, and so i was just curious like uh if if james had done that to you my second question for you emily was like who was the person kind of in the 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 world of phi that you kind of like were able to receive his or her message and be like oh okay like now i kind of like i'm starting to i can see myself through his or her voice or lens. Whereas like, I know Mr. Money Mustache did not speak to you. You were like, get away from me, weirdo. Like, you know, was there any particular people or, or person in the five movement that like when you finally stumbled upon them, you were like, okay, I can get on board with this. So I don't know that there was really like content that I consumed, mm -hmm. but whenever... I guess a year into our, not even a year, mm. and maybe like, I don't know, six or seven months, we went to a Camp Fi. And it really, I don't know, it like opened my eyes to see that they were real people. They were normal people that were doing this kind of thing. And actually, Justin from Root of Good, he talked to that Camp Fi that we went to. And hearing, like he was, when did he retire? 30? 30? Yeah, yeah, I think he had retired at 30 or 31, something yeah. like that, yeah. And he, you know, he was a millionaire, and um, he, he is living on so little, and he has uh, a wife and two... Three kids. Three kids, yeah. and have, you know, has his life of abundance. And so I think hearing his, you know, his, like, talk and just, like, his experience and his life, that really, you know, resonated with me and spoke to me, but um, there was not... I have a hard time, you know, doing the whole, I guess, like fire by, you know, that like consuming that kind of content. And so, yeah, I guess just like his stuff was was really yeah. eye opening. So it almost sounds like going to Camp Fi was the thing that did it for you. You're like, oh, these are real normal people, not just like my husband's a total weirdo who weir <laughs> reads like weirdo zealots on the Internet. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. Yeah, and it, um, also, like, you can talk to other people, like, the community of it, too, because hmm. um, that really helps having, you know, someone to, like, you know, I think we joined some of the Facebook groups and stuff like that, and being able to, you know, talk to someone that you met that's, you know, across the country 
and you know almost um having like an accountability or you know seeing like other people's like progress and stuff like that really helped yeah it's very fascinating that's the same thing that happened in my my marriage or, or my you know partnership because again we weren't married uh, we were engaged when we went to camp Phi and Carly was like, you know, uh, uh, you're crazy, but like, <laughs> all you can go be a frugal weirdo and like do whatever you want. And then it was there. She she heard Paula Pant, Pant talk about actually spending money on things that like were important to her, and also like making more money. And, it, and then Carly was like, oh, okay, I I see a path for me. Because, like, as long as I can spend on the things that are really important to me and I can focus on earning more, that's more important to me than being, like, a frugal weirdo. And then we were able to kind of, like, come together and focus. You know, I was, like, the hardcore frugal person, and I kind of let her, like, spend, like, she could spend her own money if she wanted to go out to lunch or, you know, whatever. I'd be like, yeah, cool. Go have fun with your friends. I'm going to stay home and eat. (laughs) And, you know... But we both focused on earning a lot more money. And then I think as long as one one person's kind of like, you know, making sure overall you're being frugal, that doesn't mean both people have to be like hardcore frugalists. So that's uh, super interesting. Okay. So you're both working. You start to get on uh, to the Phi path together. You go to Camp Phi. You really start to get aligned finally. Like what happens after that? So I think... When we had gone to Camp Fi, we might have already bought a property or no? So we had, so when we found it, we were in this uh, expensive, oh, yeah, okay. elaborate, you know, loft. I mean, it was, it was expensive to be like a, it was technically a one bedroom, but it was a loft. Like, so yeah. there was no real bedroom. And so we were, you know, living in that in an extravagant life. And so from there, we had bought a um, condo that was a fourth of the price and half the size. And it had an actual bedroom. Right. So we had that, but we haven't. But I don't think that we had sold the other one yet. Right. Um, so. But after going to Camp Fi and seeing the people and getting Emily on board, like at this point now, it's like, okay, she can like see that there are real people that are doing it and can trust that it exists and it works, I guess. Uh, and I mean, it works for most people. There are plenty of, you know, like there's no zero risk. But anyways, getting her on board was a key part. And, uh, at that point, like once I had gotten convinced her to move, like that, I think that was the biggest thing. Like when she said, okay, like we can move from our fancy, you know, condo that we had bought that we could have bought a three bed, two bath house in the same area. And, and it would have cost the same as our condo that we had bought. And so once I had convinced her to move to the other one, like she was as much, if not more on board than I was. And so at that point it made it so much easier because like we both had the same goals we were very aligned and so we both were frugal we were making good money especially for our area mm-hmm. and uh, combined particularly I, w- I would have been okay by myself <laughs> but combined it made it a lot better and then we really focused more on real estate not i don't i don't want to make it sound like like this was like a strategic decision we were investing in our 401ks we were investing in our iras and then we were having a lot of money kind of sitting around and we were like, are we going to, what, how are we going to invest this? Like I did, I was debating a brokerage account. I was debating the 4% rule. I was debating all that stuff. And then, uh, real estate's just faster and it's so much easier to understand and you have more control. Like I can't control what Elon Musk tweets and then, you know, raises the price of whatever. I can't control any of that. But what I can control is whether or not I put in nicer appliances, whether or not I do, you know, granite countertops. And so I can control the the rents a little bit more um, and at least lifting them up and, you know, selecting the right tenants and all this kind of stuff. And so you definitely get a layer of control. There's more involvement, but we decided to do real estate particularly. And so at that point we were like, I think we had three closings in a month mm-hmm. and, uh, and it, it was just like, they happened to pop up all at the same time. It wasn't like we were super aggressive, but we were for like, a couple of years and then we just kind of was able to take the foot off the gas pedal and just slowly accumulate as we want to or sell off so that's that's pretty much the route we took was real estate yeah okay so how long did you did it take you like once you started in real estate how long till you essentially became 
financially independent? Like how many, I guess let's, let's look at it in two uh, lenses. One, like how many units did you have to get or how many doors did you have to get? And then also like over what time period did it take you to get to that point? So I think it was 10 doors and a little less than three years. Once we bought our first like duplex, like true rental property, when we bought a property to be a rental from there, it was about three years or a little less than three years to get to the 10th door. Mm -hmm. And that more than covered our expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially, you guys became like cash flow fi. Right. Is uh, essentially what that is. And uh, just for the audience, because like this isn't a purely like fun, uh, like FI podcast, like can you break down like what cash flow fi is like in your own words? Yeah. So essentially, we were generating enough cash flow off of our real estate income to cover all of our living expenses and then some like it was Mm -hmm. a safe buffer that's great okay so it took you about three years which is like Mm -hmm. in terms of achieving financial independence is pretty freaking fast yeah which is awesome and i like explain to me and the audience like why you can do it so fast with real estate versus like just putting everything in like the stock market So there are a couple of reasons why you can do it so much faster with real estate. One is leveraging. Uh, So essentially we used other people's money, which is the bank's money most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to buy a $100,000 property, which to be honest is the most expensive property that we bought that we currently own right now is $100,000. If I'm going to buy a $100,000 property, I can put down with a traditional financing, like there's so many different avenues that you can take with other like creative financing but with a traditional mortgage loan i can go to the bank and i can put 20 percent down on the property and not have pmi not have any of that stuff and so i'm putting down twenty thousand dollars and i'm getting a hundred thousand dollar value and i'm paying back the mortgage monthly you know but it's over the course of 30 years right i cannot take out an eighty thousand dollar loan and end up with a hundred thousand dollars worth of stocks Mm. And so that's the reason why real estate is so much faster. Another thing that you can do, there's so many tax benefits. Like that's another part of it is tax benefits. We can depreciate the properties. And so what essentially the IRS says, and I'm not a tax professional, so this is a, this is not advice. This is just information, uh, for entertainment purposes, the IRS determines that your property will last. 27 and a half years. So you take the purchase price of your property, you divide it by 27 and a half, and that is a loss that you can take per year on your property. And that is an on paper loss. That is not a true loss. So you haven't paid any of that money in, but you actually get to take it against your income on your rental income, your real estate income, whatever it is. And so there are a lot of tax benefits that you get with real estate as well that you don't get with with a typical uh, stock portfolio, especially if you're selling at a profit. Like there's tax loss harvesting. There's a lot of other, you know, avenues that you can take, but you can profit in the real world and take an on paper loss with real estate. That's super fascinating. I actually didn't, uh, was unaware of that because I'm not really in real estate yet, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you guys on this. So basically, you know, you buy that $3,000 property, you divide, or excuse me, that $100,000 property, you divide it by 275 that gives you three thousand six hundred and thirty six dollars that you can write off every year, whereas like every year, yeah, every year for twenty seven and a half years, right, but like let's say let's say you buy a million dollar place that's thirty six thousand dollars you can write off every year, yeah, and that's not counting any other expenses <laughs> that you may have with that property that's, you know, that's just like the top of the line, that's top line, like you don't have to do anything else with the property, you can write that off. And like with tax loss harvesting with stocks, I think the most you can write off a year is three grand, a three grand loss. Right. And right, you can right. like you buy a million dollar property, and you can write off thirty six thousand a year for twenty seven and a half years. That's crazy. OK, now it is important to mention that there is a depreciation recapture when you sell the property. Mm. So if you've depreciated it, for instance, your million dollar property. Yeah. Right. If you've depreciated that for twenty seven and a half years down to zero, technically. Right. According to the IRS, it should be worth zero. Mm-hmm. But in the real world, now your real estate is worth two million dollars, three million dollars, you know. Uh, so when you sell that, they will try to recapture the taxes that you 
you've claimed that the property is depreciated. Mm. There are ways to avoid that by doing a 1031 exchange. So you can essentially sell your property and buy another property that's worth more money. And you just kick that uh, can down the road. And then if you die, you can go into trust and you can do all these types of things. So you can leave it to your kids without having to pay taxes. But they do try. There are ways for them to recapture the money that you've depreciated. Yeah. But as long as you're like educated and savvy, you can essentially avoid it for your entire life and and ensure that your heirs don't have to pay it either. As long as you, exactly. you stay informed and educated. That's yeah. Those are some really incredible tips for why real estate is is this is the re- like I'm really excited to have you guys on because I I'm already financially independent, but I want to diversify into real estate because I'm like why would I not utilize this incredible like financial power that is available for anyone who's willing to like learn? And like every time I have someone on the podcast who's done it with real estate or knows about real estate, I'm just like, oh my God, like there's so much potential here. Okay. Several other questions from this. So it took you three years. And at this point, Help me understand, you know, what portion of these, or maybe even it makes sense to look at it now, maybe both, uh, sorry to uh, walk you through both this. As you're building towards it, were you focused on short-term rentals that were Airbnb? Were they long-term rentals? Was a combination of both? Like, what was your kind of accumulation approach like? Um, And then after you cover that, I want to know kind of like where you're at now. So to begin with, it was all long-term hmm. and it was up until we left our jobs, it was all going to be long-term and right. So we left our jobs in 2019 and I mean, a month before we uh, moved abroad, one of our long-term rentals, renters turn in their notice. And so we were kind of scrambling, trying to decide if we wanted to um, find a tenant and fill that vacancy. Uh, in a short amount of time right before we left or turn it into a long-term i'm sorry uh turn it into a short-term rental and so we decided we kind of you know weighed pros and cons we decided to turn it into a short-term rental so we would have a place to stay whenever we came back to visit family and friends and you know eight months later you know COVID happened and you know it was you know we didn't um ever see us coming moving back to you know alabama the u.s whatever and so it ended up, um, so we got a, okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whenever we decided to turn it into a short term, we got a co-host. And so she helped us, you know, with getting everything, you know, furnishing it, getting it listed, taking care of it while we were gone. And then whenever we came back and we were, you know, hands-on, we decided to take it over and start managing ourselves. But also we kind of got a feel for how it was managing it ourselves but also like the processes and the i don't know everything the the tools that we needed to be able to you know manage it from anywhere but it took us i guess a year after having the first one that we turned another long-term rental into a short-term rental and then i don't know you can you can take it over (laughs) (laughs) it's fine you're fine so so yeah so when we retired when we actually quit our jobs we had nine uh, long-term rentals and one short-term rental. And um, and again, like Emily had said, we had just kind of fell into that short-term rental and we didn't know anything about the short-term rental market. And so at that time, we had a co-host that was essentially a property manager for us because we didn't know anything about managing a short-term rental. And then as this person managed our property, we realized like we could do it better. Mm-hmm. And there were times that like, you know, there would be questions from guests and she wouldn't respond. And so I would respond to them. And, you know, again, she's the property manager. So, and I'm not saying like, I should just be able to like take my hands off, but, um, but there were times that we felt like we could do it better. And so we started doing it ourselves when we came back from the COVID shutdown, like Emily had mentioned, uh, we were abroad and we came back and decided to convert one of our other units into a short-term rental. And so at that point we started self-managing and now we have five medium or short-term rentals and five long-term rentals. 
Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Veg Nutrition, Live Better. So I'm actually a veg elite athlete, and before I joined the team, I spent months doing my due diligence to make sure that the company was vision, mission, and value aligned with me, my values, my mission, my vision, and my lifestyle. I got to know the owners super well. I even got to know the person who formulates all the products, and they passed with flying colors. So I couldn't be more excited to represent a company that I feel so aligned with. And I want to tell you about two of my favorite products. The first is the Veg Pre-Workout. So when I first went vegan or mostly vegan, the last thing for me to go fully vegan was finding a vegan pre-workout that gave me the focus, the energy, and the power that I was looking for. And I can tell you, this is the best pre-workout that I've ever had. It gives me incredible focus and energy. And what's probably the best is it leaves me with no crash after I take it, which is great. And the flavors are so freaking good. There's literally peach mango and a Patriot pop that tastes like, you know, the firecracker popsicles, cherry lemon lime flavor. They're literally so good that I can dry scoop them. And they just released a watermelon flavor for just in time for summer. And it's incredible. So that's the first product. The second product is arguably also my favorite, and that's the plant protein. Comes in three incredible flavors, chocolate peanut butter, vanilla ice cream, and cold brew coffee. Yep, you heard me. Cold brew coffee flavor. It tastes incredible, all three flavors. 25 grams of protein, fully organic, incredible ingredients, heavy metal tested, and it is my go-to post-workout. Make sure that I'm recovering and refueling and giving my muscles the protein that they need to rebuild for that next workout. So go to vegnutrition.com slash dragon and try their full line of supplements and you'll get 15% off. Or you can just use Dragon at checkout, and you'll get 15% off. So that's vegnutrition.com slash dragon to get 15% off. Veg Nutrition, live better. And just for the audience to understand, like, what's the difference between like uh, a short term and a medium term, and then also like a long term, like help uh, myself and the audience clearly understand the difference between those three sure so a short-term rental could be anywhere from a night to even up to like a month or so Mm -hmm. three weeks something like that but typically the stays are between i would say two to five nights Mm -hmm. somewhere in there maybe up to a week Mm -hmm. typical a medium-term rental is going to be more for travel nurses people on work assignments things like that and that's 30 days or longer but less than six months typically And once you get over six months, then you're talking about a traditional long-term rental. And so that would be, you know, six months to a year to multiple year. Uh, And that has an entirely different strategy, essentially. So a medium-term rental and a short-term rental, the owner owns the property or the manager, like essentially someone owns the property and the utilities are in that person's name, the owner's name. And the owner furnishes and does everything that they need to do to it. So it's a fully furnished property. And that's for short term and medium term. For long term, they essentially sign a lease. The renter gets everything in their name. They're covering all the utilities. They're covering all the furnishings. They're covering everything. Uh, So those are really the two biggest differences. Yeah. What are the kind of pros and cons of each? Like a a short term slash uh, medium versus like a long term? So the pros of short and medium term are the income. It's like egregiously different. Uh, It's like significantly more. Significantly more. So 
we had a duplex and it's like the perfect case study, right? Because it's the same location, the layout's the same, the floor print's the same, everything's the same, essentially. One's furnished, one's unfurnished. And so our medium, or sorry, our short-term rental made three and a half times what our long-term rental made. And it's, they're literally sharing a wall, like everything about it's the exact same. And, and it made just significantly more and that's gross or sorry, that's not gross. That was net. Mm. Um, so that's counting all the expenses. That's counting vacancy rates. That's counting, you know, utilities and we leave people and the cleaning fees and we leave people beer and, you know, wine and a thank you card and fruit and all this kind of stuff. All that baked in, we were making three and a half times more with a short term mm -hmm. rental. Now the con is it's more involvement, yeah. but if you have the right stuff in place, it's not that much more involvement. And some people are concerned, like there's, it's, to me, it's not any more risk, but there are people that are concerned about the risk of, you know, someone trashing their place or having a party there or something like that. But that risk doesn't go away by having a long-term renter. Uh, if anything, you have more risk in my mind, because you have to deal with evictions. You have to deal mm. with, you know, the lease agreements, legalities. There's a lot more legalities of things and people are much more likely to have the opportunity to trash your place if they've been there for a year, as opposed to someone that's been there for three or four nights. Yeah. Okay, so why have you decided on like a half and half strategy? We don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So we like the diversification play within our own portfolio of having some short term and some medium term and some long term. Just because the medium term is like a nice, happy mix between the two. Mm -hmm. You get to have people that are there longer term. They're paying more than they're paying more than a long term renter would, but less than a short term renter would. But you only have to deal with one person, you know, a month or every few months. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that makes it a little easier. You deal with like one message, one cleaning, that type of thing. And, and then they're there and you're not having to teach people how to do everything over and over again. So the touch points are a lot less with the medium term. So we've kind of split all between the three, you know? Yeah. So what, like, obviously short term, you're using like a platform like Airbnb. What are you using for a, a medium term rental? Is it Airbnb as well, or is it some other platform like VRBO? Like, assume I'm I know nothing because I really don't. You know how how are you advertising like the medium term versus the others? So right now we are still using Airbnb just because we have um, one already on Airbnb and it's doing so well. Like it's saying practically 100% booked up, and so because of that. Um, there's the demand for it and it's working. And so I think that we'll stick with that until it doesn't really work. Um, and maybe try to do like, there are other options like furnished finders. Um, and I guess, uh, BRBO mm -hmm. that does, you know, uh, the medium term. And I, I don't know if there are other websites that target like specifically like, you know, travel nurses and stuff like that. There are Facebook groups that you okay. can join to do that, like a travel nursing Facebook group, and you can post your stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And so they've got like huge Facebook groups. So that's the, like specific to travel nursing. No one else can get on these groups, you know, essentially. Yeah. I think there are, are some for like insurance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can partner up with like insurance companies or something like that, where if someone has, you know, fire damage or flood damage or, you know, whatever situation it is, you can have them the insurance company pays you for their customers to you know stay in your place and that can be very lucrative but the hard part is getting in touch with the insurance companies getting the right processes in place so that you're the person that they call because the other side of that is there it depends on the area it depends on their policy it depends on a lot of things but let's say that you have a very nice property justin and you have some fire damage or some water damage or some mold or something like that right and you have an insurance claim so when you file that insurance claim, your insurance is supposed to cover you with renter's insurance, but it has to be a similar property or it's supposed to be a similar property. So someone that has a really high end Airbnb could get someone there for three to six months that is waiting for their house to be finished up. And they have, for instance, a million dollar property and they can charge just egregious amounts of money to the insurance company uh, and the insurance company cuts them a check directly. And so that that is a interesting niche that you can get into if you're doing uh, media term rentals as well. <laughs> interesting. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit more of my backstory. So my brother is a nurse who travel is doing travel nursing right now, 
and him and I are getting into real estate together because he lives in uh, Washington State where I live in Northern California where real estate is like incredibly expensive. Now, real estate is still expensive in Washington State, but like he's in a smaller uh, like town area, which I'll, I'll leave like unnamed on the podcast. Um, but uh, it's infinitely cheaper than here. And one of the things I was just talking with him about is I was like, man, like, I feel like we should have a hybrid, you know, uh, portfolio of short term because he already Airbnbs his place out. He's converted his garage or, or his, uh, he rented out his own house and lived in his garage for the whole summer. And that was like his first foray into Airbnb. And he's like, oh, my God, this is so amazing. You can make so much money. Now he's turning his garage into like livable additional Airbnb space. Then just the other week, you know, he was telling me that because uh, he has constri- construction skills. So he's actually helping. He works for a travel nursing company, but that travel nursing company owner just bought a place next to a hospital to house tra- travel nurses. And I just said to him, I was like, we got to figure out how to like plug into your network of travel nurses so because it's just like they're perfect rental renters, at least in my mind, because they're like they're professionals, they're respectful, they they obviously have good income, so you don't need to like worry about them paying. And you know, you can like have them for a month or up to six months. And so I'm just curious if you have any like thoughts, like how do I utilize my brother's construction skills and travel nursing like access to like help propel us forward into the world of real estate. So, I mean, you've essentially described it yourself in the fact that your brother's boss is buying properties near hospitals, right? Um, that is a key thing to me. And it doesn't necessarily have to be travel nursing. Now, that That's like an incredible like resource to have. We've had PT students, mm. we've had things like that. And so if you can get into a major metro that has colleges, mm. that has, you know, a, a major hospital, Uh, anything like that these people are going to be staying there like mba students who are trying to finish up their you know dissertation and all these different things but specifically with your brother it could be there are some particular metro areas and uh i'm not gonna just rattle them all off but there are some that have hospitals in areas that aren't necessarily the best areas Mm. and so that is an opportunity where you could buy a house that's close by to the hospital that you obviously don't want to buy anything in a war zone, right? But at the same time, you can buy something that needs a little work and that he knows that this is a consistent place where people get contracts. Mm. And if anything, you get in with a travel nursing company and say, hey, you're going to this space. We suggest, you know, these three places and your brother's is one mm. of them, right? And the other one could be an RV park. The other one could be, you know, an extended state, right? It doesn't really matter. But um, being the the go-to person for that particular area. And then if you end up with, this is, this is like a, a, a specific strategy that I choose and that other people don't necessarily agree with, or, you know, people that have different choices, right? I'm of the mindset that if I want a property or if I want to live in Florida, right, I would rather buy more properties where I'm at to pay for me to live in Florida, yeah. right? So for instance, I wouldn't say you should buy properties around five, uh, hospitals around five different states, right? I would pick five properties around the same hospital in the same state. And as long as you know that they're getting travel nurses, you become the niche go-to person for that because then you only need one cleaner. You only need one Mm. handyman. You only need one lawn guy. You don't have to create all these different, uh, teams in all these different states and learn all these different rules and regulations. You can become the go-to person in your area. And that's what I prefer personally. Interesting. So we should almost, you know, because of the skill sets available and the access available, we could like pick one town uh, that has like a college and uh, a a hospital and just focus on properties around there. And that would be like the medium term. And then we could also provided that there's like some good Airbnb opportunities there as well have that same team that takes care of the medium term, take care of the short term. And then we could even look at long term as well. And then that same, you know, cleaning team and all that, we would just be able to like keep it all in the same family, so to speak of, of operations. 
That's exactly what we do. And there's another strategy that not a lot of people talk about. So I'm glad we're talking about Heck this. Yeah. What you can do is there are a lot of like different uh, dynamic pricing tools that you can use on Airbnb. But essentially what you can do is you can have a property that is a medium term rental also be a short term. Oh, rental. yes. Okay. So for instance, we have to talk about this because there's <laughs> these festivals that happen uh, where we're at. So summertime is crazy good for sh Airbnb short term rentals. But then the other like nine months of the year would be perfect for the medium term. So like, tell me more. Okay, so there are slight differences, I will say this, between the furnishings in a medium term versus short term, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a short term, people are only there for, again, three nights, five nights. It doesn't really matter how comfortable your couch is, how like comfortable your bed is. People will slum it for a few days, and it can look really nice, you know? Like, there are plenty of couches that look really great in pictures. They've got, like, really cool feature walls. They've got all these different things, but that's not necessarily what a long-term person would want. So it has to be a little more comfort in mm -hmm. mind. But what you can do is there is a tool. There are different tools. Uh, we personally use Price Labs. We're not like sponsored by them or anything. But it is a dynamic pricing tool that you can use to price your Airbnb, short-term rental, VRBO. It works across a few different platforms. And what you can do is you can prioritize long-term bookings by saying anything outside of two weeks from now, we're only going to accept bookings for a month or longer, right? And then once it gets within that two weeks, if there's not a booking that's already taken up that month, then it, the the software will automatically allow people to book three or four night bookings, right? But for instance, in your situation that you're talking about, you could make it available for the, from this point to this point is going to be, um, you, can, you can book it weekly for the festivals for different things like that, right? But let's say October 1, you decide that you want it to be a medium term rental. So then all you have to do is change the software to say that you will only allow, you know, 28 day bookings or more or three weeks or whatever you want it to hmm. be. Right. Um, three weeks is not really medium. It's like a medium to short term. But, you know, that's something that a software can do. So if anybody's looking, you can charge less and you can only make it available for, let's say, a month or two months or three months if they're looking for more than 30 days out. Now, if it's less than 30 days out and those days are available, then you can offer those for nightly rentals instead. I love it. This is incredible. So essentially, I think this is a perfect time to bring up that you're actually releasing or just recently released uh, a course on, you know, developing an Airbnb business. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So we've created a course and it's mostly me talking like I am now <laughs> and Emily's doing a lot of the background stuff. So she's created all the templates. She's created like all the spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. And um, so what we're doing is we're teaching people how to do what, exactly what we do, which is manage your Airbnb remotely. Mm. So we have, again, like I mentioned, five short to medium term rentals and we manage our entire portfolio ourselves and we'll take six months and go snowbird in Florida. We'll go to Mexico um, we, we've done a month abroad in Europe. Uh, we've done a couple months abroad in Europe and, uh, and are managing it ourselves entirely remotely. The long-term rentals, the short-term rentals, the medium-term rentals, we're doing it all ourselves. And so we're teaching people how to do that specifically with the short-term rentals on this course. There may be a course in the future where we teach people how to do it on long-term rentals, but right now we're focusing on the short-term rental game and teaching people how to do that remotely, which includes like finding a local team. What do you need to furnish it? Um, what remote essentials do you need? Like, what do you actually need to be able to do all this stuff remotely? You know, just like the cleaning checklist, maintenance checklist, all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff. Uh, the the messaging templates, everything. Everything you can think of pretty much we've covered. That's great. So if people want that, where do they get it? So this is a good opportunity for me to ask you, hey, Justin, do you want to be an affiliate <laughs> for the course? And we can send people to your link. Or do you want us to just plug the course? Let's do both. So, and then I'll okay. tell the production team to to pick one of them. We can talk okay. business offline, but uh, yeah. we'll do one with Code Dragon and then one just like whatever. Perfect. So if you're interested in the Airbnb, the remote Airbnb management course, you can go to rethinktheratrace.com slash dragon, and that's going to send you the link. And then... If you're interested in the Airbnb uh, remote management course, then you can go to rethinktheratrace.com 
slash str dash course. And that's str is in short term rental course. Awesome. Cool. So tell us a little bit more about the course. Like, how long is it? Like, if you can share the price of it, you know, what do people like? What's what's the value promise of it? Um, you know, walk us through a little bit more of the details so the listener, you know, can find out if it's the right fit for them. Sure. So I know we've been talking a little bit about procuring the property. We don't actually cover that in this course. There may be a bonus lesson on that in the future, but we're actually talking to people that either have a vacation property, they have a long-term rental that they're looking to convert to a short-term rental, or we've even got a student that rents out their personal residence whenever there's like a festival in town, like you're mm -hmm. talking about. He actually is using this opportunity to manage it while he's on vacation with his wife so that he can choose to rent out his space for much more than their vacation would cost abroad, right? Um, and so that's a great opportunity as well. I, I, it, there's a lot of flexibility with short-term rentals. So how long is it? It's got a little over two and a half hours of video content. And with every video, there's an accompanying lesson that has uh, details uh, below. And that's all via text. And so that goes into a little more depth and uh, different things like that. It covers, sorry, I forgot what all of your questions were. Oh, the price. So the price is currently $399. That's a price that we're testing. So you, it may go up and we will warn people before it goes up, but we don't want anybody to feel like they're missing out. It's currently $399, but it may go up uh, based on demand and based on the value that people are getting out awesome. of it. Um, the value proposition is that you can convert a long-term rental into a short-term rental and do exactly what we're doing, which is you can up to 3x your money. I love that. That's absolutely awesome. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about real estate. You know, for example, so me and my brother, right now we have one property that is kind of like long-term like rental, but uh, we're considering like turning it into more of like an Airbnb um type thing or even like a kind of a hybrid airbnb slash like well-being retreat destination but i don't necessarily want to talk about that because i think your course could teach us exactly how to take that place and like 3x its current uh return um what i do want to talk about is like let's say myself or the listener like we want to understand like what are some good resources for us to figure out how to get more into real estate like you know, maybe buy our first property or our second property, you know, what are some of the things either you did or you would recommend to someone who's like, okay, I'm really fascinated by real estate. Like, where do I, how do I start? Like, what do I read? What do I listen to? What uh, resources uh, do I go to? Yeah. So there, there is a fine line too. I can recommend a million resources. And then I know plenty of people that take these resources and then turn that into an entire job of its own. And they just consume and consume and consume and they never yeah. take action. So the number one thing is take some action, listen to something. And it's fine to like want to figure out what niche you want to be in or to find the type of content that uh, resonates with you. But you've got to take action. There are so many people that just listen and read and do all these things and know so much more about real estate than I do. Yeah, they, they don't have a single property and there's that's and that's OK. I'm not saying that everybody should own and manage real estate, but the people that do like it so much and then don't own anything like what are you doing? You're just sitting on the sidelines yeah. forever. So that's the first thing that I'm going to preface it all with that. I personally like um, I like Coach Carson. He is a content creator and he is doing exactly what we are doing. His his whole strategy is the small but mighty portfolio. Mm. So we have 10 doors that provide us enough money to live on. And we live, I think, pretty lavish lives. Um, and it, I mean, it's not extreme, you know, but I'm just saying we we live the way that we want to with 10 doors. There are people with 100 doors that aren't getting the number, the cash flow mm. that we're getting because they're more obsessed with becoming the biggest landlord or, you know, like different things like that. It doesn't really matter for us. Cash flow is king. And we want to own the least amount of properties to give us the most amount of money. That's our goal. But there are plenty of people that are into storage units. You know, that's the type of real estate investing, or they're doing syndications, or they're doing, you know, a million different things. And Bigger Pockets is a huge resource for that. You can find every type of real estate investing on Bigger Pockets. To me, it's more important to pick a niche, figure out what you're passionate about, what interests you the most, 
and what what is achievable for you. For us, at the time that we were starting, syndications did not make sense. We had no money. We were buying the mm. cheapest properties. Like we bought we bought two duplexes for fifty grand. We bought another condo for forty three grand. We bought a duplex for forty seven grand. Like we were buying the cheapest places, and we were putting twenty percent down. Like we didn't mm. have the cash for these. So there are some things that aren't feasible uh, if you don't have the money management or if you just don't have the income. So in a situation like that, you should be focusing on house hacking, which Craig Kerlop is like the guy to go to for house hacking. Uh, he covers all that in depth. And that's for people that want to live in a unit and rent out a unit or live and have roommates or different things like that to lower your housing costs. Um, there are so many different ways to invest in real estate. But I do think that those three resources, uh, Rachel Richards with Money Honey Rachel, uh, she has a lot of great information on real estate and hers is not necessarily a specific strategy, although she does have uh, multifamily units, but now she's getting more into mm -hmm. syndications. Uh, she just has very relatable information and it's for, you know, the average person. It's not like, you know, I have to have a million dollars. Like there's some people that are like a Grant Cardone or something like that. They're creating content for somebody entirely different tax bracket yeah. than I am. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. This show is brought to you by Feel Free from Botanic Tonics. This product is unlike anything I've ever had before. No joke. It's made with kava root and other ancient plants, and just half a shot gives me this incredible sense of focused flow and productivity. And I love to take just half a shot right before I work out. I take it with my pre-workout and it takes my workouts to the next level. It is seriously unlike anything I've ever had. It's also an incredible productivity tool for any big work projects that you have or long periods of time where you just need to be super focused in flow state and get a lot of shit done. So if you want to give this a shot, you can go to botanictonics.com and use code DRAGON at checkout to get 40% off your first order. No joke, 40% off with code DRAGON. That's feel free from botanictonics.com, code DRAGON. Feel free, feel good. Yeah, it's funny you brought up Chad Carson because I, I literally said to my brother the, the other week, I'm like, I'm going to get Emily and James on the podcast. And then after that, I'm going to get uh, Coach Carson because I feel like their strategies and what they're doing is what you and me are going to want to do. So the cash flow is king and like small but mighty. Like that sounds exactly kind of like what we want to do. At least to start, I mean, we can always go into like syndication and like Grant Cardone, like 10x, like, you know, billionaire, blah, blah, blah later. But I think it's it's like for us, what sounds fun and exciting is is more like along the lines of what uh, the two of you are doing. And, you know, I'm not as familiar with uh, Chad Carson's work, but I, I, I found his podcast and sent it to my brother and I was like, start listening to this and I'll work on getting him on my show. <laughs> so. He's got a really good book. It's called Retire Early with okay. Real Estate. And in the book, it, he wrote it for Bigger Pockets. And at the end of every chapter in the book, he essentially does a profile of different people that have retired mm -hmm. with real estate. And so the whole goal of that one is retirement with real estate, not necessarily the small but mighty, but it does cover a lot of different strategies and different ways that you can retire early with real estate. So at the end of every chapter is a profile of a different person that has achieved financial independence with real estate and each one of them have That's a different great. strategy. So the whole point is to show you that there's a million different I'll ways definitely to get it. that book and we'll put it in the show notes as well. I'll probably buy a copy from my brother too. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, next up, you guys are going to have to write a book, you know, after you get your course going, you're going to have to, uh, after you have the course going for like a year or so, you're going to have to talk about all your clients and all the different ways, you know, they did what you guys did. Yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> I'll take 10% royalty. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Anyways. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about, uh, if, if you don't mind digging into the numbers just a little bit. So you got 10 doors. Um, are you okay sharing, you know, approximately how much cash flow that brings in a year as well as net worth? Yeah, sure. So our short-term rentals, typically bring in like the, the, the problem is we haven't, we've 
we're sitting in one that we just launched <laughs> yesterday. And so it doesn't have a booking yet, but, uh, and we have another one that we're actually finishing up now, but I expect by the, by a year, calendar year, we'll be making a hundred grand a year off short-term rentals. And then our long-term rentals, Emily does the bookkeeping for us, but so she might pipe in and say that I'm completely wrong here. But, um, so we're going to have a hundred grand a year. That's the goal on the short-term rentals. And then the long-term rentals, I believe are bringing in about 30 to 35 grand a year. I might have to verify that. Okay. She's going to verify that. She's got her spreadsheets and all that stuff. She's, she's the bookkeeper and I'm the, uh, I'm the yeah. doer. Still, that's great. And we can update it in the, uh, in the post-production if we need to, but like, I would say between a hundred and 135 grand in cash flow, like right. even in like yeah. NorCal where I live, the Bay area, like you can live pretty great off 120 grand a year. And if you're exactly. where you live in, you know, Alabama, 120 grand a year, you're like balling out of control. Yeah. We're still buying properties too. So we're buying, we bought a property last year with cash and we've just bought another one with cash. And so, um, uh, we're making enough cash flow to, to buy another property and then we'll sell one off if we don't like it, you know, that kind hmm. of thing. But we typically keep what we buy. We've sold, we've sold, I think three properties yeah. total. And, um, and so I think, you know, if we added all the doors we had, I believe we've had 14 doors and now okay. we're down to 10. Now 15. what's right now? Four. Uh, so what's the strategy long-term? Are you going to stay around 10 and just keep like up leveling or are you going to like grow to more than 10? Like, or like what's the small, small, but mighty strategy. Do you stay small, but mighty? Do you eventually like, or like, ah, let's get into syndication. Like what do you like? And I know this could change like a year from now, but I'm just curious where your head's at. I, I like where we're at, where we are at right now because it feels like a, a good amount to manage ourselves and to not get in over our heads. I, there could be a chance, you know, that if the right deal pops up in the next, you know, month to, you know, six months to a year, then, you know, we'll try to scoop that up. But, um, and there's, you know, there's a chance that, you know, in the next year or two, you know, however many years, whatever, that we might get into uh, mm -hmm. syndications. You know, it just depends on where we're at financially and, um, you know, how the market looks and stuff like that. I think, right, you know, in the next year or two, we're going to try to focus on paying off, you know, a property or two and try to maximize our cash flow instead of having to, you know, mm -hmm. put it to the mortgage or, you know, that kind of thing. So, I think that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. I just want to ask what you mean by being in over our heads. <laughs> no, I, no, I. <laughs> did you mean by like management? Did you mean we're going to create a job out of ourselves or did you mean we're broke? No, oh. no. I just, I just meant in, I, I just don't want to get where, you know, we have so many properties that, you know, we like neglect one or, right. you know, we just, I want to be able to um, be able to focus on our properties and give our tenants and our guests the best experience and have the best place to live. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So net worth with all your properties factored in, where are you at? So I guess our mortgages, how much do we have in mortgages? Like something like 200 grand. I think we're right at a, like a little over a million dollars okay. in net worth between the properties that we own, the value of the properties, the mortgages that we have. And then we have some cash on hand, but then we still have our 401ks and IRAs from back when we yeah. actually worked. The cool thing about this is I asked you the same question uh, back uh, when you came to the Money Mastermind. And, you know, you had a significantly less net worth then, but you were still financially independent. Like you did not actually need to work like you could live off of all your cash flow. So it's really interesting to see that um, cash flow number ten, uh, and the net worth continue to like you know, move upwards as you're doing this. So my next kind of follow up question to that is, you know, I know I've, let, let's take the course out of it because I know that's going to like that takes time to, and like plenty of time to build uh, not factoring in the course on average, like how much time per week or month are you putting into those 10 doors? So I think on the average week, I'm spending about 30 minutes a week managing uh, the real estate. And that's including the short-term rentals, messaging guests. And there are weeks that it's less. Like we we were at FinCon, um, you know, a, a month ago. And we went to Universal that week as well. And so during that week, like I spent very little time actually doing things because all the all the guests were taken care of using automated messaging and things like that. And I looked to see exactly how much time I spent that week 
um, on the Airbnb app, which is primarily the the way that we would manage the short-term rentals. And I had spent 15 mm-hmm. minutes that week on that app. And so, um, so that's just me personally. Emily does, again, like I said, the bookkeeping. So she's tracking the expenses. She's doing the stuff like that. And that, she may say something different, but that ebbs and flows. So there are times that she's doing, you know, a couple hours in a week. And then there are times that she doesn't touch it for, you mm-hmm. know, two or three weeks. So... Yeah. So I'm not sure how what you would say on average. Well, I'm going to say if I stay on top of it, maybe 30 minutes to yeah. an hour. Yeah. And then, okay. So basically let's call it four hours a month or you like don't do shit for like three weeks and then you have to do like two to four hours in a, in a week. Okay, right. cool. Mm-hmm. I love that. Sorry. I'm just uh, thinking through uh, my own situation with my brother. So kind of like, uh, and that's not factoring. Like I know from the other podcasts uh, that I've listened to in preparation for this, like you actually do a lot of the construction work uh, for your places because you, it's kind of like work that you enjoy. So for me, like I would never do that. Uh, but my brother, he loves it. He's really good at it. He's like, he's like you and he, like Mr. Money Mustache where that stuff is kind of like fun and interesting to him. So I'm just like thinking through, you know, uh, I guess if we look through it through the construction lens, you know, on average, you know, per door, how much kind of like, time are you you know putting into uh and i understand that we could totally hire this out but i'm just trying to get a a kind of a if my brother wanted to do it like how much you know time would he spend per property yeah so that's a great question and i should probably track it more but one thing i will say is i don't do any maintenance Mm -hmm. on the properties the maintenance is done Mm -hmm. i'm just not doing it so I'm not the one going over and changing a garbage disposal. I'm not the one, you know, repairing a, a a plumbing leak or anything like that. So the only time that I go into the property is if it's empty and we're renovating it to, you know, whether that's to get better long-term renters, whether that's to turn it into a short-term rental, uh, different things like that. And so typically I'm only in, I would say, a property a year. But in the past year, I think I've done two. Um, and we just closed on this one. So, uh, but I probably spent like, we closed on it a few weeks ago. So I've probably spent 24 hours actually working mm-hmm. on this property um, in the past month. And so, but the other properties, you know, they get neglected when I'm working on this. So that, that project, I'm not going to say properties get neglected, but uh, so my other project uh, got put on the back burner. So I'm, I honestly don't have any clue how much time I spend because I might do like an hour, you know, or two hours in the morning and then not touch it again for the rest of the week. Or there might be a day that I'm really motivated and I'm going to knock out an entire project and I'll spend 10 hours that one Mm. day working on it. Um, So, but it's typically one property a year because we'll do it during a turnover. And with our long-term renters, they're there for, you know, a year. And so we'll go in and paint or, you know, replace cabinets or do whatever, uh, you know, and it'll be just once a year that we actually touch a property. And some of them we don't have to touch at all. Like there are a few that I haven't done a single, I haven't turned a screw in. And so, uh, so that's always okay. great too. So, uh, this is great. I really appreciate you sharing all this. You're helping me figure out my strategy with my brother. So like my mm-hmm. brother, he's a nurse. Um, he's currently doing travel and nursing funny enough. I'm curious, like in terms of our strategy going forward, you know, let's, let's, let's pretend we didn't have a, a property, um, and we're both working cause you know, I have a podcast and two other kind of like, uh, careers that I, I do. Like, how did you guys do it when you were working? Like you bought, like you bought one place, you bought two places. You just kind of like failed your way forward. Like, cause you talked about, you know, just taking action and like, you know, read a little bit, but like really just like go do it. Like, uh, coach me through that. Okay, so our first property we bought, we were actually out of the state. We were on a work assignment. Emily had a work assignment in St. Louis. So our first property gave us the opportunity to do the whole, you know, passive income, uh, invest where you're not, that kind of thing. Because we were in St. Louis, but we bought in Huntsville, which is where Mm -hmm. we currently invest. And so our first property we bought, we got a property manager. And so that we didn't Mm -hmm. touch anything with it, right? And so then I think that might have like uh, jaded us a little bit because then when we came back down, we bought a couple more properties. And at that point, I was spending like mornings working on the property, evenings working on the property, and I was going to the gym. So it depended on what time of day I worked that day. Um, I would either go to work on the property before I went to work 
So I would end up at the property around 5 a.m. or so and do a couple hours worth of work. And then I would be there uh, on the weekends. Or if I went to the gym in the morning before I went to work, then I would come mm -hmm. over in the evenings. And that would be like whenever I was really working on it, that would be like a couple of weeks where, you know, Emily and I, we would see each other, but it would just be for <laughs> dinner, sit down, like, and I'm just like dead. Uh, and so that was like hectic, I will admit. Um, but the other side of that was like, we were buying again, really mm -hmm. shitty properties. Like, uh, I mean, like the quality of the property itself, the neighborhoods were great, but we had bought two duplexes, so four units from one guy. And in my opinion, he was a slumlord. Yeah. Right. And so it was like, it was like the landlord special, everything in there was painted over. Like it took forever to get screws out, like, because everything had mm -hmm. paint stuck in there. Like it was stuff like that. It was a lot of band-aids hanging the whole place together. And so once I started working on it, it just took a while to actually get everything to the level that we wanted it to be at. And the good news is we both had our jobs. This wasn't a situation where these properties needed to fund us yet. Now they currently are. But at that time, we were using our jobs as like our main investor, if you want to think of it that way. Our jobs, the companies that we worked for were investing in our real estate, right? Because we were just taking the money that we were making from the, uh, from the jobs to work on the properties and to continue to acquire yeah. more properties. And so it was a lot of early mornings and late nights uh, yeah. at the properties. Hey there, just a few words about the incredible show sponsors for today's episode, and then we'll dig right back in. Today's show is brought to you by Fit Rich Vegan. If you're ready to get in the best shape of your life, double your income, and 10x your savings and investments, then this is the coaching program for you. But wait a minute, Dragon. Isn't this your coaching program? Heck yeah, it is. I spent the last eight years mastering my fitness and my finances, and I've built an incredible coaching program with an incredible team to help you get the body of your dreams and finally achieve that level of financial success that you've been seeking. So if you want to find out if you're a good fit, for the program, go to fitrichvegan.com and book your free consultation today. Or you can just DM me on Instagram with the words fitrichvegan and we can chat about if it's going to be a good fit for you. I'm committed to empowering people to actually achieve their fitness and financial goals. I spent the last 20 years trying to figure this out on my own. And what I realized is the key to doing it is not doing it alone. You have to have coaches, you have to have mentors, and you have to be a part of masterminds. And that's exactly what Fitch Rich Vegan has. It has coaches, mentors, and it is a mastermind. So again, if you're ready to book your free consultation today, go to fitrichvegan.com or drop me a DM on Instagram. Was that a year or two? Like, how long did you kind of like, uh, like, I don't know, uh, you know, <laughs> put in that work? It was, it was about a year to get, yeah, yeah, it was about a year. So we would work on one side and one unit would get done, luckily because it was a duplex. And so we could start renting that side out and then we would start on the other side. But one place had a lot of uh, structural issues. And so we had to ha hire out and have them come in and go under and do the crawl space and do all this stuff. And so during that time, that property was completely vacant for a, probably close to a year mm -hmm. after we had bought it. And, uh, and I thought this is never going to like, we're never going to get this done. This is going to take forever. And like, we had actually had the first contractor come to look at it and we were talking to him about renovating it. And he, he literally looked at me and said, bulldoze it. <laughs> He said it was not worth it was not worth saving even so uh, but we kept it and it's still it's still renting it's doing great and uh, it just took a lot of a lot of work. It. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about mindset because uh, I feel like you, James and Emily, kind of have a natural mi mindset to like uh, go down this like real estate endeavor. But like, it, put your like coaching hats on. Like, what is the type of mindset that like somebody you know like take me and my brother as an example like uh let's pretend we have no properties like how what kind of mindset should we approach uh, like this whole like real estate um you know endeavor with like how should we be thinking 
like, you know, what coaching would you give us kind of from like more of a mental emotional versus like the actual strategy of like, Hey, go read these books and, you know, just buy your first property. Do you hop in on that or? Um, I, I want to say that like, you know, anyone can do it. Um, and it's like entirely possible to do it. And I mean, mistakes will happen, but you just learn from them and move on. Um, and then, you know, make sure that you like you know put that into like moving forward like you learn from that and you implement it into like you know your real estate your life you know whatever but i think that you know anybody can you know invest in real estate and you know it is a learning experience because i feel like we you know where we were whenever we first started investing is completely mm -hmm. different to where we are now um so i think that anyone anyone can do it so i would say Yes, anyone can do it. And but Emily would also be the first to tell you <laughs> that uh if it were up to her, if if let's just say for instance, you know, something tragic happens and James is off the face of the planet, right? I've died or something, right? Uh Emily would have a property manager. She'll be the first to tell you. She doesn't want to deal with the tenants. She doesn't want to deal with like being the um, you know, go-to person mm. for anything like that, right? It's just a different personality type. Mm -hmm. I 100% think she can do it. Right. But she tells me all the time that she is so glad that like she's not dealing with X, Y, Z. I think she could do it. I think that uh, it's just because I take the burden of it off of her that she feels like it might be harder than it is. Yeah. Uh, well, it's also the stress of it. I don't I don't handle stress well. And so, um, you know, James can take a, you know, a situation and then, you know, just handle with ease kind yeah. of thing. And so I, I don't handle like confrontation well either. So if there's a tenant that, you know, there's some kind of issue or, you know, if there's. You know, if we were finding a tenant for a long-term property and, you know, it's just that kind of like salesman, um, salesmanship or, you know, like making sure that everything is the same for every tenant that way you don't have to, you know, run into any issues legally or anything like that. Like I'm, you know, I would have a hard time with that and it would be a, um, a learning curve for me. Yeah. Uh, so that to me is like one part of it, right? Is that you don't have to manage real mm -hmm. estate just because you own it. But the mindset to me is also you cannot get attached to properties. Um, we, we've lived in properties and I'm like, I would sell that tomorrow <laughs> if the right price comes along, you know? And so to me, it is a business decision and you have to treat it as such. So it's, you can look at a property and you can really like it, but if it doesn't make sense from a financial perspective, if it's not going to cash flow, like to me, there are so many people that are like, like we, we know people that say, like, oh, this house is really nice. Like, we might buy that and invest it. Like, like we'll invest in that property. And I'm like, do you know how much it would rent for? Do you know how much it would cost you to maintain that property? What is the rental pool like? Like, this is not a cash flowing property. You've paid $400,000 for a house that will rent for $1,500. Mm. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So to me, that's an important aspect. This is not about HGTV. This is not about what pictures well. This is about what pays you money. And if you're going to put your money into it, it better give you some money back. Otherwise, it's not an yeah. investment. That's a hobby. And hobbies cost money. And some of them can make you money. But uh, to me, that is a very important distinction that you have to ha go into it with a mindset and with the thoughts that like, is this going to make me money? Is it not going to make me money? What's the likelihood of that? Because some people will start fudging numbers and say, well, you know, if I buy and I raise the rent $500, then it'll start making money. And I'm like, that's not realistic either, though, like. What are you going to do to raise the rent $500? It's already got everything it needs. It's already got granite countertops. You can't pick it up and move it into mm -hmm. a different location. So to me, you have to be able to delineate what you want for your personal life and what you want for your business life. And those can be two very different things. Where we currently live in one of our units, but there are plenty of people that would never touch yeah. one of the units and live in it, right? And so those, those are very different investment styles. And that's okay with like, there's nothing wrong with buying a property that you wouldn't live in. You just have to know that that's what it is and not try to buy something that you think looks really good and is gonna look great when your friends, you tell your friends you're an investor and actually you're bleeding money because you're more concerned about the optics of it than you are about what it's actually doing yeah. for you as an investor. This is great. I really appreciate that. It's helping me make sure that I go into it with like my business you know, mindset hat on and not the like, I want to look rich in <laughs> mindset like that I had as a kid, which I, this naturally kind of brings me to my next topic. And it's something I, I've talked to Cody about and I've talked to Brad Barrett about uh, Cody B Berman for the audience. Obviously, you guys know which Cody I'm talking about is, uh, you know, I'm financially independent as well. Uh, I did it in a much different way than you guys do it. 
But one of the things I've been exploring over the last, I would say, year and a half, two years is not being so frugal and actually starting to spend more money on the things that really like bring me joy um, and really kind of like uh, the way I think of it is like what got me here isn't going to get me to the next level. So example, for me, I'm spending a lot more on personal development and coaching and programs and masterminds because like I want to go from multimillionaire to decamillionaire to then on, you know, from there. And so I'm like, okay, like I think frugality is such a powerful tool in the first, like the first accumulation phase. But then like, if you look at the truly like like you know the decamillionaires the hundred millionaires you know the the billionaires like they're not they're smart with their money but they're not like house hacking <laughs> do you know what i mean and so i'm just curious you know where you guys are at and i've been trying to think of like what the term for it is it is it the like uh you know the 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 scarcity phi abundance crossover point do you know what i mean uh and i don't know what the right term is i'm trying to like frame it because i'm trying to frame it for myself because i'm trying to understand what i'm going through because like for example me and my wife we just moved into a very nice looking home um we're renting but like we spent nine years living in like a place that we would not be proud to like show our friends it wasn't like terrible but like you know, we watched all of our friends like buying the nice homes, but like our net worth like outstripped almost all of them. You know, I mean, of course, some of our friends like hit it like big with tech startups and whatever. And, you know, that's that's an, an, another topic. But I'm just like so we're kind of exploring like, OK, what does it feel like to live in a much more expensive home that like is not frugal at all? Now, we're still fine, even with the like the increased rent. But I'm just curious, you know. Are you guys at that point yet? Are you still in the hardcore frugality point? If you're starting to look at some of the ways to spend more, you know, on the things that bring you like deeper kind of richness. And I mean that not just monetarily, but from a like a life richness, like what are some of those areas? And if they're none and you're still hardcore frugal, that's okay too. I'm just like, I'm having this conversation because I'm trying to figure it out for myself. And also like, as people get to this point, how do they start to make this crossover so i just i was laughing because i'm like justin just shit on frugality for like five minutes and then it's like that's not gonna get you to the next level if y'all are still there though <laughs> you can feel free to say that <laughs> no, no no but like and i get I it like, like, no, 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 i get what you're saying I frugal for like two years free. like literally told my wife yeah, yeah. we can't go to the movie theaters anymore <laughs> like we're we're never eating out again yeah. i mean now we eat out but back you know for two years i didn't eat out so uh, we agree a hundred percent. Like yeah. we used to be that way. Like it was, it was egregious how like frugal we were. Emily left a restaurant mm -hmm. once to go get a slice of cheese from our <laughs> apartment because she didn't want to pay for the like dollar extra that it was going to be to be a cheeseburger. In but, my defense, our cheese was going to go bad. So it needed to be eaten. <laughs> and I got some steps in. So. so that was when we were on the path to five. We are yeah. definitely not at that level anymore. <laughs> um we we are spending on things that we truly enjoy and you know that that includes mm -hmm. like travel um particularly uh more more so than just about anything else but um health emily's had a few health issues and so she's bought a course and she's you know focusing on like trying to get to the bottom of like what is causing it as opposed to just doing treatments mm -hmm. and so that's something that's very important to us yeah and along that same thread is uh mountain biking is like a hobby maybe of mine i think it's of ours but i feel like i'm dragging emily along sometimes and there was a time where like i would have and i did when i started and this is like another just caveat i guess but when i started i bought a 50 dollar bike and i bought it from a crackhead <laughs> on facebook and i don't say that like jokingly one of my friends like started to work on the bike and he found literal syringes in the seat post so like i actually <laughs> bought it from a crackhead on which Facebook. he probably <laughs> stole it and so but like, i'm sure i'm sure that was stolen now i feel bad about it but i didn't know and uh so that bike though did at least help me establish the fact that mm. i was actually going to go and bike right like 
if if I had bought, you know, a three thousand dollar bike and then it just sat in the corner and I didn't actually establish the routine of going and biking and I didn't even enjoy it, like then what what a waste of money that would have been, right? But now I've gone from that, you know, uh, shitty fifty dollar bike mm-hmm. to a two thousand dollar bike, and Emily's got a you know a, a really nice e bike that's even nicer than mine, and that's something that we would have never spent on when we first pulled the trigger on buy, like. My relationship mm. with money was not healthy. Uh, when we first, like, what got us here is not mm. going to get us there, that type of thing. When we first hit FI and quit our jobs, I was tracking our net worth as, like, rigorously with a spreadsheet. Like, we were posting about it uh, on our blog. And I was almost, like, I'm trying to think of the term I would, I would use, but it was, I was purposely keeping it low. And to, to the detriment of our mm. personal, like, happiness, I was like, no, 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 like, I need to beat mm. last year or last month's numbers. Like I need it to be like so cheap. And there are some times that it's fun. And then there are times that it's absolutely not. And so it was almost artificially low. Like I would, sh- I would make decisions that I wouldn't normally make so that I could just prove on the spreadsheet that, you know, we're still making more money than we were, yeah. you know, whatever. And we've got enough money to live on. And once I quit tracking that, yeah, it became much healthier. Uh, it's like now I... <laughs> I, I have to get on to Emily. Like, we'll go to the store and she'll like nitpick pick over like something. And I'm like, just grab the first item that you come to. It does not matter. This dollar that you spend here, it like, you know, thinking about which one is going to be the best for X, Y, Z. Like, it's one thing to choose a, uh, an item that you're going to be happy with. It's another thing to like, just beat yourself up over a dollar and you're going to spend 20 minutes in the store thinking about like, I should have bought this other one instead. Like just grab that thing and get the hell out of there. Like it's such a waste of time to me. And so, so yeah, that's, I'm, I'm trying to think of like other things that we actually spent on. We bought a truck, uh, which we were a one car family and we bought a truck to make it much easier for us with the real estate and stuff like that. And it just became hard for us to drive around with two cars family and have something. Okay. We have two cars now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not the three that we had before, but uh, <laughs> uh, and that's like something that's just so simple that like when we would go to Florida, we would drive down to Florida, and like if we wanted to pick anything up, we would shove it in the back of our SUV, which is like the best SUV in the world. I love it. But at the same time, if we wanted someone to come with us, they couldn't ride with us because we had so much shit in the back, or we had to pick something up on the way. And now that we have a truck. We can drive around with our friends, with our family, and we can have stuff in the back for the rentals and like, you know, make, make a good trip of it. Like if we're driving up to Nashville, then we'll buy, you know, an oven or something like that, that we wouldn't be able to get around here, that type of thing. And so that's something that like, you know, thousands of dollars on an extra vehicle. uh, And that's before you count the maintenance and all this kind of stuff. And like, I would have never been able to rationalize that before because I would have been like, no, we could like, you could walk wherever you're going and I will drive the car. Like, and it was just going to be ridiculous. Well, it's also like you can take a, you know, a truck full of people and go on a mountain biking trip yeah, yeah, and yeah. like have all the bikes on the back. Or, you know, yeah. So I'm curious. Thing. My hardcore frugality was about approximately two years because that's how long it took me to become a millionaire. How long was your like super hardcore frugality? Okay. I would probably say three years. I think three. Yeah, I think three. I was like... going to say two, but. Maybe two and a half. Yeah, I would think three. Like from when we found Phi, like I was more frugal at the beginning. Oh yeah, that's true. and then and then until we actually hit financial independence, and even after financial independence, a little bit. Yeah, like yeah, uh, that's true. That was it was yeah, it was I, really, for sure. Really I hit Phi, and I was <laughs> like, no, I'm still hardcore frugal. And then I just kind of like over the last year and a half, year and a half, two years, like have starting to been like, okay, like I was similar to you, uh, James, like. Uh, for me, uh, it wasn't about keeping my expenses uh, low. Uh, it was in a sense, but all I was focused on was my savings rate. So like at one point I had gotten my savings rate over 90%. And But I was working both sides of the equation, both the savings or the expenses and the earnings. So I was like, whatever it takes to earn the most money and spend nothing. And like, it was ridiculous because there was like times I was making like a hundred grand a month and it was just like, it's like, and you spent how little, like what the fuck? But it powered me to five so quick. So 
I'm curious, do you still like hardcore track your expenses and stuff? Or now you kind of just like loosey goosey, like, hey, like as long as we're kind of like trending upwards, like I'm not as maniacal as I was, or I'm just curious where you're at there. Okay. Loosey goosey for sure. Yeah. Uh, we track our real estate expenses, but our personal yeah. expenses, we barely track at all. And as long as it's trending upward and we have enough money like set aside, oh, I'm God. not concerned about it at all. And I mean, at the beginning too, part of that's just the uncertainty. Like you've quit your job, like you yeah. don't know if it actually is going to work. Like it's yeah. just like a little bit of fear. And so now that you know it works, like you just got to trust it and just not, I don't know, just be yeah. an asshole all the time. Yeah, it's really money. interesting. I think uh, everyone kind of like, if you want to truly like master money, you need to go through this kind of like, I don't know, formation phase where you are pretty maniacal about tracking everything so you can really dial everything in. And then you do that for long enough and you almost develop kind of like an intuitive sense of like, uh, like, are you trending upwards? Are you trending downwards? And so now, like, I have that intuitive sense. And then I just like open up personal capital like every week or th like three, like maybe I check it three times a month at most. Just kind of look at my expenses, like, okay, what's what's what am I doing? Am I still saving more than I'm making? Like, okay, cool. Like, I don't really care. I don't need to optimize my grocery bill or anything. But the first two years, I was like, anywhere I could cut, I would go nuts. Um, so it's interesting to see that you guys are kind of doing the same thing. It's like you've built. It's like you've built the. Uh, the money muscles and now you're just kind of like doing a little bit of maintenance like just making sure you're holding your baseline and then you're kind of like exploring all these other parts of of your life and then i think now especially with your digital course that's coming out you're like hey i want to focus more on like entrepreneurship and building building things uh like focusing more on the earning um and less on the saving because like you like you know earning is almost infinite uh saving you can only you know mm -hmm. frugal yourself down to a certain level but like earning uh is almost infinite especially as you start to broaden your portfolio of like earning uh you know products so to speak uh so you got port uh you got your your real estate you have a digital product coming out and i'm sure once you kind of master the digital product you'll probably go after some other interesting thing that is like fun for you to make money Boom. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I, you know, for two plus years, I didn't get a massage. <laughs> and now I get like a massage, like at least, you know, uh, once uh, a month, if not like four times a month. Uh, but I remember like <laughs> for two years, I was like, I'm going to get on a foam roller. I'll do it myself. Like, <laughs> like I will literally <laughs> use my own hands to massage myself. Uh Okay, let's talk a little bit about fitness before. Uh, are you guys okay on time? I know I've like taken a ton of your time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about fitness because you guys uh, are, you know, super into fitness, like like me. Um, what are you guys currently doing for your fitness? You know, what are you currently passionate about? Obviously, the mountain biking, but I'm just curious to hear from both of you. We'll start with Emily. Uh, you know, what are you doing for fitness right now? It kind of ebbs and flows. Right now, I'm just going into the gym and doing my own thing. So I'm like separated out, kind of like James does, and do push, pull, mm -hmm. leg, and like arms and abs. So like, you know, working out, I don't know, four to five times a week at the gym. I do like to, I just did a triathlon, a sprint triathlon um, like two months ago. So I'm still trying to keep up with the swimming and the running and the biking as I can. Right now, it's hard, you know, whenever we're doing all the rental stuff and trying to get like the not rental stuff but when we're working on a place it's hard to find the extra time i guess because you know we're trying to like get this done as quickly as possible kind of thing but i um do enjoy doing like pilates and yoga um but uh we also mm. try to get like walks in every day i just try to get some kind of movement uh which is a big thing mm -hmm. but yeah yeah well for me um it's a lot of that as far as like we get the daily walks and we'll go on a hike or we'll go on a walk something like that um i've been doing pretty much like almost like a bodybuilding type thing but uh but it's also like powerlifting. so i start my workout with a big lift and uh and then from there it goes into more of like a bodybuilding-esque thing i yeah. i do love kettlebells and i was doing a lot more of like functional movements and it just became really hard for me 
like depending on what gems mm-hmm. we were at because we kind of bounced around a lot and so it just became harder for me to to maintain exactly what i was trying to do and so at the at the my favorite thing is like to do essentially a month or you know three weeks of working out like the the type that i'm currently doing and then do a straight week of just like a lot of like kettlebell functional like fun stuff like where i get to throw stuff around i've got to work on my hand eye coordination i'm doing like a lot of turkish get-ups i'm doing a lot of like the really like functional stuff i'm doing switch snatches with the kettlebells i'm doing like you know just all sorts of like fun things that like have creativity you know but also like flexibility and then you're working on a lot of stability stuff um and so i really enjoy that but more so i really enjoy powerlifting that's why every workout starts out with powerlifting and so you know i'm doing uh you know a bench and then i'll do like the rest of the pushing movements and then i'll do deadlifts and then i'll do you know a bunch of back stuff and then i do squats and then i do a bunch of leg stuff and so uh, i just really enjoy uh powerlifting and being able to put like a lot of yeah. weight on the bar and move it around. A yeah. Little bit. So it's interesting you're talking about the kettlebells because I literally just did a one week pure kettlebells and all like full body movements. And it's like, uh, just like the mind muscle connection it, because you're doing all these weird moves with weight. It's like so much more challenging than just doing like traditional like bodybuilding. But, uh, the, you know, I'm 40 now, so I'm not as like young as I used to be. And I was just like, these full body workouts, because I was doing like uh, four full body workouts, I was like, this is beating the shit out of my body. And so like this week I went back to my like push pull leg split because like, you know, one part of my body is like sore, but like still there's two other kind of like mm-hmm. big sections that I can go like focus on. So I was like, huh, how do I work this in? Because it was really fun. But I was like, I don't know if this is sustainable for me to do like an entire month of like you know, four to five days of like full body workouts with kettlebells and push myself. And so some of the questions I've been asking for myself is like, do I do like, you know, throw in like one of those a month, like, or do I like do uh, those, but I only push myself to like a six or a seven out of a 10 effort. Whereas I tend to like push too hard. Like I always want to push up towards a nine or 10 out of 10 effort. And I'm just like, maybe when I do those, I got to kind of like dial it back a little bit. But it, it's like challenging for somebody like me who like really likes to push myself. So it, it's pretty cool that you're into the kettlebells as well. And you literally just laid it out like you will do like a week of that and then you'll go back to like three weeks of push pull legs. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And no, what no, no, I was ahead. doing was uh, sorry, you can go ahead. OK, what I was doing for a little bit was I was doing essentially like every other workout would mm. be that type of workout. So, for instance, I would do a bodybuilding, you know, push and then I would go through and do the rest of my bodybuilding legs or whatever. Right. Um, and then the next time I was on push, mm. I would do a kettlebell push. Right. And so it would be like all like fun movements, you know, where I'm doing like windmills and I've got to do a bunch of overhead stuff and I'm doing like bottom up presses with the kettlebell and like just all sorts of different things like that. And then I would do the same thing with pool, right? So it would be like a traditional bodybuilding pool day. And then the next pool day would be like, I'm doing, you know, kettlebell rows. I'm doing like a bunch of snatches. I'm doing all sorts of like pulling movements and swinging around and all that kind of stuff with kettlebells. And so it was every other workout, which that got hard to track. So I think that the three yeah. and then one is going to be No, the that's way to funny. Go, I hadn't thought about it that way. What I was thinking is like doing a push pull legs But I would do like, you know, uh, I'm also super into gymnastics rings. Um, So like I've done like, uh, you know, four day a week on gymnastics rings plus two leg days. So like a push, a pull on rings, another push and a pull on rings, each of those like separated by a leg day, like traditional leg day. But I was like, huh, maybe I do like uh, like a hybrid of uh, like a push rings, like for two exercises, a push, uh, for like two exercises, traditional bodybuilding, and then like two kettlebell push. So it's like all three of them in one workout, but all focused on push. And then the next pull day do the same thing, but pull. And then, uh, I haven't figured out leg day yet, but, uh, that's where I'm currently. Yeah. Yeah. So you're making, cool this is great. This is perfect timing, uh, to have this conversation. Cause I literally just last week was my first like full week of kettlebells. Um, awesome. How about, uh, 
any particular, you know, recovery routines that you guys are focused on? This is something I'm more focused on now that I'm uh, older at 40 at, you know, your age. I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like now I foam roll every day. Like, uh, you know, I use my Theragun every day, but I'm just curious, like, are you focused at all on recovery or mobility? Um, any of that? Mm -hmm. We pretty much do that every day. Like, or at least the days that we go to the gym, mm -hmm. we, we start our workout with like a lot of like, you know, the yoga mat and we're, we're doing like hip flexor mm -hmm. stretches. We're rolling out everything. Like we go through an entire like warm up routine essentially before we work out, uh, just to kind of work out like some of the, some of the kinks from the previous workout or work on some flexibility, like really trying to work on my range of motion. Um, and so that's been helpful, like implementing that every workout, as opposed to like, I used to just mm -hmm. do like foam rolling on leg days and, and then I'd come in, you know, three or four yep. days later and I'd be tight. Right. And it's like, if I do it every workout, then I can maintain a certain level and even progress as opposed to like, there was a point not that long ago that I was having a hard time almost touching my toes. And now, uh, it's like, it's honestly ridiculous. And my flexibility is terrible. And so I've been trying to purposely like work on it now. And so now like I can like stand on mm. my hands essentially. Like I can put my hands under my feet. Um, and so it's stuff like that. I don't know if you have anything to input, but. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of harder right now because our gym is um, on the verge of like closing and then opening a new, a new location. So they've closed part of the gym and then the spot where we can go and stretches mm -hmm. um, with classrooms. And so if there's like the um, silver sneakers class going on or something like that, we can't go in there. And so, and, and it's at the forefront of my mind because this morning we weren't able Happens to, today, yeah. yeah, we weren't <laughs> able to like sit down and stretch and everything, but, but yeah, it is. Sometimes we'll go to the gym and just stretch if we haven't, like if we've, you know, had to make a road trip somewhere or something like that. But yeah, like when we go down to Florida, we'll do that. Cause like yeah. we snowbird in Florida and we'll drive down. And, uh, the next day, like most of the yeah. time you don't feel like working out the next day, right? Like, I mean, you've been sitting for 10, 12 hours in the car. And so we'll go there and just roll out, just stretch, just like, you know, really do some like deep work on that. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know, some functional stuff, but it's mostly that body weight, just like crawling around and trying to, you know, find some, uh, range yeah. of motion that we've lost from the day before. Yeah. But I am interested in like getting massages because I don't oh. think that I've ever really gotten a massage. So what kind of massages do you get? Great question. So I love Thai massage for two reasons. One, they're cheap, uh, cheaper than like if you go to like a spa. And I actually feel like most of the time, like, uh, like traditional like Thai mas massage therapists are like way better than some like random person at a spa. I found like I like the ones where they'll literally walk on my back and they will like use their like their heels and their knees and like go nuts on me. Um, my wife, you know, she'll be like, don't walk on me. But, you know, because like she doesn't I like super deep tissue massage like I like it to almost hurt like borderline uh, hurt. Um, whereas my wife likes it a lot uh, less hard. But I would highly recommend like most I've I found most cities have a Thai massage place. And so I'll just search on Yelp like Thai massage. And they're usually like, you know, a half or a third of a cost of what it would cost at the spa. And in my opinion, like I've gone to plenty of like nice spas, too. And I'm just like, this sucks compared to like my Thai massage. Um, so that's what I always focus on. Um, sometimes you can find like a good Chinese massage, uh, place as well. And, uh, I've just found personally, I like the Thai massage. Uh, so I would s start there and probably, you know, where, you, you know, where I live is really expensive. I'm in, you know, Silicon Valley Bay area. Um, so like you guys could probably get it for really cheap, uh, where you live. Yeah. Um, and dead serious, like when you start getting a massage, and you just realize like, oh my God, I feel so much better. Like that investment in your personal well-being, like now that, I mean, you guys are millionaires, you're financially independent, like, you know, why not? Like you're rich, like, do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> so it's funny, I just have to uh, comment. I actually now, now do foam rolling and mobility work every day before I work out now too. 
And it's so much easier if you just do it every day. Sometimes I do it for 10 yeah. minutes. Sometimes I do it for like 40 minutes before I even start working out because it just feels so good. And then I have like my workout is so much better because like my whole body's like loose and prepared, warmed up. You know, I've like smashed out those weird knots that have developed. You know, I've helped like, I don't know, push through all the uh, weird fluids that need to be moved around, et cetera. So I love that you guys are doing it. One recommendation for you on top of the like, get a massage, try it maybe once a month. If it feels good, do two a month. If that feels good, like, why not once a week? You guys are rich. So, like, for me, that's what I started doing. Now, sometimes I get busy and I forget to get it. But, like, my goal is, like, my true fit rich life is I get a massage a week. And eventually, when I get to a certain level of wealth, I'll, I will have the massage therapist come to my house. Right now, I'm like, and eh, that's a little excessive. So, I'll, I'll go to the Thai massage place. But I would highly recommend you guys, if you don't already have a percussive, uh, a percussion gun, get get a Theragun mm. or some version of it. I love the Theragun, but like it's not cheap. It's like six hundred bucks, but it is incredible. So during my warm up, I foam roll, I stretch, and I Theragun like my whole body. So I basically give myself a whole like body like massage before I even work out. Game changing. So. Just wanted to share that with you. I've got to give that a try. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people talk there, about it. And I think even a couple of our gyms have yeah. one, but I've not used yeah. it. Well, you've also talked about using the drill. Oh, well, they make, a, they make an attachment, not a drill. They make an attachment for your jigsaw. I've seen oh, the the, right? I like, saw make, like, someone yeah. at the gym with a power tool that had. I was so yeah. glad to hear and that. And I was like, <laughs> I was literally impressed. I was like, dude, if I was still in my frugality mode, that would be me. But like the Theragun is worth it. It's like totally like it'll last you years. It's not like, oh, you got to buy a new $600 power tool every year, um, you know, provide you don't like drop it or throw out a window or something. So I guess uh, kind of like following up on the fitness, you know, uh, my real kind of like big focus in my life and kind of with my coaching clients and everything right now is like, you know. Uh, asking people and helping people figure out like what their fit rich life is. So at this point in your current evolution of life, like what is your fit rich life, James and Emily? My fit rich life is to be able to do what I want when I want without uh, the need for assistance. Mm. Um, whether that's, you know, again, financially being able to go wherever I want to go, but also like the idea of, like, I don't want to have to have help picking up a bag and putting it in an overhead mm. compartment, right? I don't want to have, like, that's to me the level of fitness that I need to maintain so that I don't become a burden. I want to be the person that, and I also have a, I have a, I don't know, maybe it's a complex, but I have a need to be needed a mm. little bit. And so if someone is moving things, I want to be the person they call. I want to be the one that they're like, James will lift all that shit. Like, James will do everything. Like, bring him over. I want to be that person. And so, uh, so that's my favorite life. I'm real quick, Emily, before you say anything, next time we move, I'm literally paying for your flight and you can like Perfect. come stay with me and you will help us move. Cause like, I was like, oh yeah. my God, this is, I mean, we, we paid I, uh, movers, but we should have paid them for more than one day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. I actually worked for two men in a truck for like <laughs> a few weeks one summer. Uh, so I know all the tips. But Awesome. Emily, over to you. I don't know, I, part of it's the same, um, but like, you know, be, I guess like maximizing the, like my life and the longevity of it and um, feeling my best, hmm. but also, um, you know, having the, um, I don't know, the flexibility and the, um, I don't know, like I want to be able to, you know, go to Europe and be able to walk without, you know, having to stop and, rest or you know go on hikes with friends and be able to keep up and um you know that kind of thing and just i don't know just having the best life to the end i yeah. guess awesome i love that well you guys have given me almost two hours uh the next time there's a couple of future topics because i want to have you guys back especially after you've had your course out for a little bit but i want to talk about fasting because i know you fast james as do i I also want to talk about like parents and money, um, but let's save that because this one's, we're already getting pretty long in the tooth. 
Um, is there any, you know, last words of wisdoms uh, uh, that you'd like to share? Any requests of the audience, or really anything else that you would like to share? I can't think of anything, but again, take action. Like that—that that to me is the biggest thing. Like there are so many people that just consume and consume and consume, and there. I say this like almost tongue in cheek, but also not really. The type of people that just sit and are consuming so much financial content or so much real estate content and not pulling the trigger are the exact same people as the people watching Netflix and not doing anything mm. with their life. You know what I mean? And there's not anything wrong with sitting down and enjoying Netflix. But to me, if you're not pulling the trigger to like actually take action on something, you're just watching for the sake of watching. And that's the same as sitting back and watching something yeah. on Netflix. Well, the same could be said about your like financial health too. Like, I mean, the same can be said, like, you know, sitting at a job for 30 years and just waiting until, you know, you're 65 to retire and not doing anything with your yeah. money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love it. So take action. Uh, best place to find you online is Instagram, Rethink the Rat Race, or somewhere else? Exactly. Yeah, Instagram, yeah. Rethink the Rat Race. We do have a blog at RethinktheRatRace.com. Uh, we have a post on there recently. We quit posting during COVID. It felt weird for us to, like, because I was posting net worth updates monthly, and everybody, like, a lot of people were having a hard mm. time. And for me to post, like, oh, we're doing better than we've ever done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it felt it felt like I was going to get canceled. It felt like, like um, I'm like treading carefully yeah. here. So we just like didn't yeah. post. And so uh, so that kind of got us out of the habit of posting. But I'm going to fire it back up because I'm going to start posting some uh, some Airbnb specific content and some content specifically around like managing, operating properties like that. Kind awesome. Of stuff. Cool. Well, James, Emily, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's such a pleasure to reconnect with you. I'm so stoked for your success. Super excited for your course. And we definitely got to get to uh, together, uh, in person one of these days, uh, so far we've, uh, only been virtual friends, but, uh, we're going to make it real. Either I'm coming to Alabama area or you guys are going to come to NorCal and, uh, you know, we'll get some workouts in and, uh, eat some vegan food. Thanks for tuning in. And remember literally everything can be used as an opportunity to learn, to heal, to grow and to transform. So whatever is going on in your life, choose to consciously and proactively harness that energy and use it to alchemize your life to the next level. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or on your favorite social media and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As always, you can find me at Justin David Carl on Instagram and all the socials as well as at alchemizelife.com on the web. Until the next time, sending you lots of energy and plenty of dragon magic.